Hello and welcome to Temp the Temple of the Silver Stars public class series, Selections from Magic Without Tears. My name is Ruth and which, with me is Rex. Say hi, Rex. Hello. Uh, Rex is my co-host for this class series. We are both academic instructors with the Temple of the Silver Star. Uh, Temple of the Silver Star has two tracks, academic, which you're seeing uh, you know, that side of us today, and we have an initiatory track. Um, we are a nonprofit philemic organization that's been around over 12 years, and we provide uh, two tracks of training, as I said. Um, both tracks, academic and initiatory, were designed to provide preparatory training in ceremonial magic, Raja Yoga, Kabbalah, Tarot, Astrology, and more. Using the foundational tools, we seek to guide the student towards a deeper apprehension of the true will, the law of Philema, and his or her own psycho-spiritual constitution. You can visit our website, totss.org, to learn more about joining the academic track or being an initiate. Um, and we have academic uh, campuses and study groups all over the world. Uh, I'm currently in Southern California, and uh, Rex is spearheading our study group that's uh, in the Pacific Northwest, um, Seattle area. Uh, so, you know, sometimes we do have uh, local class meetings, but of course there's a pandemic happening as it's 2021 currently. And um, so we're doing online series, sort of a joint uh, interactive class with the Seattle and uh, Los Angeles area campus and study group. Um, so tonight we are gonna be talking, this is our second to last class. We've been doing a series on selections of uh, Magic Without Tears written by Alistair Crowley. And um, tonight we'll be ca uh, covering chapter 68, The God Letters. Um, so this is sort of a little bit uh, of a different chapter than some of the other um, subject matters that we've been talking about. This one, I think it's a little more fun, a little more playful and um, you know, a little more mysterious uh, of a chapter. I don't know if you guys have gotten a chance to read it. Um, we'll certainly be going through it. Uh, Rex, what did you want to, do you have anything to add to that intro? Uh, only that I, I, I got a kick out of this one. There's a lot of humor, a lot of fun uh, wordplay. Crowley is pretty good at that when he's, uh, you know, when he's on. And uh, I thought he was with this one. And But there's a lot of thought provoking stuff as well. So it was, it was kind of the best of everything. Yeah, I really, I, I chose this one just because I'm like kind of a huge, uh, a huge alphabet language nerd. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's kind of something that I've, it always really fascinates me. It's interesting because this one doesn't have a lot of gematria in it, but it kind of starts to introduce you to the world of a magician and how they think about language and, you know, alphabets and um, sort of the, the symbolism behind like letters and even like, uh, you know, Crowley especially talks about how pronunciation um, is really key uh, here. His, this is kind of his analysis of uh, pronunciation of letters and syllables. So, um, you know, I thought it was really interesting to get that perspective. Um, and just like starting off with it, he talks a little bit, bit about, uh, you know, a, I think a variant an Indian language of Sanskrit but, you know, most importantly, he says, um, you know, the importance of all this, I'm sure I've told you how Thoth, god of magic, the wisdom and word, is usually shown with uh, style and uh, papyrus as the inventor of writing, which is uh, the real magical art. You know, he talks about how, like, this is, uh, you know, one of the key things when you work with the god Thoth, who is, you know, the god of magic, um, you know, uh, is that he's, he's a writing god. Um, so, you know, one of the keys of uh, magic is to, is to write and use language. Um, and then he says, hence grimoire is nothing but grammar to cast a spell, spell to ex explain itself. And the angel uh, was merely the secretary and he references the Greek word for angel, which means messenger. Um, so the messenger of the word, you know, the logos of, of God. Um, so, uh, you know, it, which is all interesting. And then in this letter, he's like, well, I thought it would be, uh, you know, I was thinking of language in its supposed primal state where grunts and groans, moans and yells and squeaks and the like were the nearest anybody ever got to it. Um, you know, the subject is closely bound with mantra, yoga and invocation. Um, so that's kind of how he wants to uh, pull it apart uh, in this letter. Um, Rex, did you have anything to add to that? Just like Thoth in general? <clears throat> Well, I think, um, you know, that's, that's where he 
that's where he kind of starts out and uh and that's where he ends as well at the end of the chapter and kind of in the middle he kind of takes a left turn into into other areas talking about uh hebrew and some of the other uh so i think it's a funny structure you know he starts out with this kind of premise that you know we're going to go with the the basic sounds the grunts and the squeaks and then then he's then he actually gets a little bit ahead of himself but it's just funny yeah, it's interesting. He kind of does reference quite a few sort of other texts, um, his own and other people's that uh, talk about language, like using and thinking about language in this way. Um, you know, he mentions, uh, I'm going to butcher this name, uh, Fabre d'Olve. Um, he was like a French occultist uh, who was born in the 1760s and kind of lived through the French Revolution. He was really influential. I've seen his work referenced before, especially this specific book called the Hebraic Tongue Restored, the true meaning of the Hebrew words reestablished and provided by their radical analysis. Um, and he kind of was, you know, this obviously like early, early occultist writer who uh, like sort of did a linguistic analysis of Hebrew in this kind of like uh, symbolic standpoint. Um, I've only read little chunks of this book, so I can't, you know, speak to like how much of it still holds up in our current day and what we know about Hebrew. Um, but it, it, it was a really influential book. I think uh, Elipheus Levy um, read this book. I know Paul Foster Case references it and here Crowley's referencing it. So um, if, if that's something that you're interested in, it is on uh, archive.org. I'll, I'll share it with you guys if you want to read it yourself. Um, if you're interested in just like pulling apart uh, Hebrew language, the Hebrew language, um, you know, you will find, uh, you know, knowing the Hebrew alphabet <laughs> just as a, a basic structure, um, just like knowing what the what the letters look like and, you know, like a little bit about uh, the Hebrew alphabet in general will really help you studying Kabbalah. It, it's something, um, yeah, so I shared it in that chat. It's on archive.org and, um, you know, you can find it on uh, Amazon too. Um, but if you want to read it for free, they have it uh, on archive. Um, you know, you will find that like Hebrew is a really important magical language, especially for like Kabbalistic purposes. But, uh, you know, there's other like books that are foundational, um, the Sefer Yetzirah, you know, which specifically, um, you know, talks about Hebrew letters as sort of like forming the world. Um, so anything you wanted to say about that, Rex? Um, well, just especially with, with a lot of Crowley's writing, you know, he, he falls back pretty heavily on it on his knowledge of Hebrew and the correspondences to all the letters. And, um, from there, you know, tarot, astrology, like you know, almost anything you read by Crowley, you're almost required to have at least a basic idea of like, what it is, these things. So it is definitely worth some time to, to understand uh, with Hebrew letters specifically, since we're talking about letters and God letters, um, to understand a little bit more about those. Yeah, there's, um, you know, English isn't quite uh, as, um, what's the word I'm looking for? English doesn't quite take the attitude that other languages do that, you know, letters are sacred. Um, certainly if you've ever worked with runes, you know, if you've ever worked with like Sanskrit, um, you know, syllables, like often uh, I've, I've done Tibetan practices where you kind of like, in, you know, visualize um, like just a, a Tibetan A, a Sanskrit A, and you sort of like meditate on it. So, you know, the idea that like, uh, even just letters are imbued with like a magical quality, um, you know, it's something that other alphabets certainly, uh, you know, carry forward, even into the modern day, you know, there's a sacred quality, um, you know, and then he, he points us uh, in this letter quite, quite frequently back to book four, uh, his, the, the big blue brick. <laughs> which is also online. Um, you know, he talks about uh, AUM, you know, with the vowels, one seems, one does seem to find a natural correspondence. And he, he kind of talks about, you know, he does this experiment with people where he's like, okay, so if you, um, you know, just say, ah, it's someone, can you put a, an image into their mind? If you say, or <laughs> if you keep believe, he says he tries to do it on a train or something and he annoys people. But that's sort of, you know, him just trying to get to those really basic physical manifestations of sound and to see like what sort of um, happens when you pronounce them. Um, 
and you know if anyone's ever done like the uh you know the lesser banishing ritual the pentagram you know when you say like uh the god names you know you draw a pentagram and then you say yore vavi you know you are pronouncing like each syllable as if it was almost like separate you know you kind of like uh vibrate them so there is something to that i think too um, which he's trying to express like why do you do that um here's what uh so yeah he he goes to like the the om that everyone knows in hindu the a-u-m um and he says a is open breath u is the controlled force m is no breath at all and uh if you look up what he's referencing he kind of talks about uh in magic book four you know he talks about how it Aum is the sound produced by breathing forcibly from the back of the throat and then gradually closing the mouth. These three sounds represent the creative, preservative, and destructive principles. They are many more points about this enough to fill a volume. And I think he does talk about it later, but that's in the his book on um, prana, his chapter two uh, in Magic Book Four on pranayama and its parallel in speech mantra yoga. Um, why you would do like a, a mantra like om um it, it actually has like a symbolic um sort of reference in, just in pronouncing it and saying those syllables so that's kind of what he's talking about there i believe um because you have anything like to add about that sort of actually pronouncing things and that no, i think that's i think that hits it on the head um it, it caught me to the his uh opinions here about the rest of the vowel sounds to me, I is a shrill feminine sound. O is a roar of the male. U is pursed. E, hardly significant. Yeah, he kind of editorializes a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> His own sort of, I don't know, personality level um, ideas about vowel sounds. Uh, you know, I don't know if any of it should be taken too seriously, uh, but that's how he felt. Uh, I really love, there's a little portion he talks about the, the Greek magic papyri. Um, and there's a footnote about it. He says, as magic, the Gnostics were chili con carne plus molten platinum, plus a few girls I have known on the vowels. <laughs> Their incantations consist uh, almost entirely of combinations of these. Um, and I kind of looked that up. I was like, okay, let's find the magic Greek papyri. And, you know, um, it's basically the magic Greek, pap Greek papyri were like a series of uh, sort of papyri. They're written kind of I think mostly after, um, you know, year zero in the common era, uh, 100 uh, to 400, um, maybe a little bit before, you know, and then a little after um, common era. And there, there are manuscripts that basically like were discovered in the antiquity trade in the 1700s on. So they're kind of fairly newer to like our, you know, sort of research and uh development towards them um and i did find one you know i was looking through like okay what's an example of how they use vowels i'm confused i did find one reference um the, and the, there's one called the uh the mithras liturgy um and this was just like something from you know wikipedia although i have uh i have a friend who has practiced this before i didn't realize he, what he was doing and i'm like oh you're referencing this um so basically the the four elements uh, are represented as like vowel sounds. Um, the speaker invokes the four classical primordial elements uh, punctuated by uh, voci magigai, magical sounds uh, in the following sequences. And they say like popping sounds, hissing sounds uh, are characteristics of these incantations. So while you're doing these, uh, you know, magical spells that uh, the Greek papyri reference like Egypt, um, Greece, and I think like a little bit of like Alexandria, Africa. That's where like all of this stuff would sort of be coming from, um, which is a pretty important area if you're studying magic. Um, and then also like mm, um, there's you know all the all the all the uh, vowels kind of represent like yay, uh, ooh, ah, e. There's fire, earth, yay, yo. These elements here refers to the first origin of my origin, which is his complete body. So it's like the body of Mithras is actually supposed to be made. Um, by these vowel sounds uh, and these elemental sort of, uh, you know, incantations that you're doing. So I, I believe that's sort of what he's referencing is the yao uh, kind of things that you would find in the, the Gnostic papyri. Um, so that was my little research uh, nerd out. And if you're interested in that, there's a little explanation of it on the Wikipedia um, 
page for that. So kind of fun to check out. Um, it to me, it seemed very. Uh, if, if you study Carl Jung, Carl Jung kind of had a, a few visions that were sort of mithraic. <laughs> um, so that's all I'm going to say about that. But uh, and then so he goes, you know, he talks a little bit about the vowel sounds. He's like, yeah, that's all great, but the consonants, like, that's a harder nut to crack. He says. Um, so I think Rex, that was kind of what you were getting as he sort of takes a different tack. Yeah, he just he starts to kind of fall into his uh, what I think of his normal pattern of breaking out letters and the correspondences and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, it's interesting when he says the here's the gutturals, uh, and they're actually like he says it's G. You know, uh, ch uh, you want to share some comments? Okay, Sarah, what's up? Sorry, I didn't know if we were allowed to, to add in. No, I mean, especially with Sanskrit, but so our mouth is, our nervous system within our mouth is the most directly connected to the brain. So it's not just the pronunciation and the throat and the openness or closeness or even positioning of the head, but it's also in Sanskrit at least, and probably all languages, it's the placement of the tongue as well. So as you said, it's symbolic, it is. It is a symbolic incantation that we're doing through an oracular, um, an auditory way rather through, rather than written word. And then with that too, with the, with the pronunciation of the vowels. So you find that geographically. And I know, cause I've lived all over like up and down the East and West coast of this country. So especially with the A, right? The further up that you go geographically, the higher the pronunciation. So there's an ecological embeddedness of the language as well. And then you also have this, um, you know, the metamorphosis of spirit into matter. So when you move from the vowels, which are more of the spiritual angelic nature that are kind of moving between the realms between heaven and hell and the earthly planes or what have you, once you start to uh, concretize them or, or turn them into a material embodied form, then you start getting the, that's what the consonants are gonna be for. So that's why it's a little bit trickier because now we're actually you know, we're, we're moving that spirit into something that's materialized through the consonants, but it's, it's all magic, right? So. <laughs> sure. I mean, I think, I think what Crowley too, like, you know, you were getting at, most Crowley was getting at, you know, it's a similar, you know, he wanted to get to those like guttural sounds, like what is the primitive sound, um, you know, that people, people make, and that is a very sort of raw energy that has to be, you know, translated um, into more concrete, uh, abstract terms and also and that's, that's where the elements come in too because you're gonna get you know the the reverberations within different levels of our own being psychic being or heart being or more of a primordial like you said being an earthbound so kind of <laughs> i'm curious about the the four letters you were saying um what the associations they're making with the elements you know, I haven't studied that specific, you know, Greek papyri. <laughs> so I, I did share it. Um, if you want to like take a look, you're more than uh, welcome to. It's in the, the Wikipedia uh, Mythodorus liturgy that I shared. Um, so <laughs> it's, uh, you can find the, um, the book itself, uh, the Greek papyri. It's, I think it was published in, I want to say the 80s. I think it was like Chicago Press. And then there's probably like a wiser edition of it too. Um, so it is available, uh, you know, for our own study as well. Uh, you know, and just going back to like, you know, invocation and using your mouth to create vibrations and, you know, speaking of the tongue, uh, that all is connected. Um, you have like a cranial nerve, your vagus nerve, which is like sort of runs down like the back. It goes in your tongue and it, it goes kind of like down the back of your spine. It runs all the way down. It's vagus because it's wandering and it wanders down, it touches your heart and your lungs and your diaphragm. And it can actually, uh, it's, it's related to your autonomic nervous system. Um, and it can actually cause like, if you have uh, sort of butterflies in the stomach or um, you know, things that are sort of like upsetting you, it can cause digestive issues because it runs all the way down. So it's sort of one of those fascinating things that our body kind of unconsciously uh, helps us to regulate, uh, but it is connected to the tongue too. So you can kind of do like some autonomic um, tinkering and play with yourself and get yourself in a trance state that actually like moves your whole body. Um, 
but Crowley doesn't talk about that in this letter. <laughs> if only, if only he had the physiological knowledge that we do now. Um, but yeah, he does. Uh, so like getting back to like just the, the gutturals, you know, he's like, well, here's all this stuff that happens in the back of the throat. Um, and he relates these like, you know, he, he spells them out with, uh, you know, the English alphabet, like G, K, uh, Ch, K. These are all actually like related to uh, Hebrew letters. So like the, the G would actually be like uh, the Hebrew letter Gimel which is, um, you know, related. So all the, I have a Thoth tarot card. It's not the one, it's not the high priestess, but if you look at your Thoth tarot deck, there will be um, the attributions of the, the letters. So that one's Zane, it's the lovers. So if you have a deck and you want to see what uh, the Hebrew letter attributions are, they're all written on. Um, so these are all kind of like, uh, Chef is the chariot and the sign of cancer. Kof is the, you know, the wheel of fortune um, in Jupiter, which is, you know, related to the planet Jupiter as an attribution. Um, and then cough uh, is the, the moon card, which is related to Pisces. And he says, like, you'll notice all these um, cards and all these attributions and letters, uh, they're all like very watery and feminine because he believes that the, sort of the throat is like a, a very like sort of feminine vessel. Um, Rex, did you have anything to add to that? No, Analogy? no, I think you're run right on target. I mean, he's he's falling into like what, like I said, he's kind of falling into his familiar territory here with his uh, correspondences. Yeah, he always falls back to you know his Kabbalah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and then he kind of goes through uh, you know the dental and labial consonants. Uh, you see that his his Kabbal Kabbalistic language, his Kabbalistic logic, uh, it doesn't really. He's like it doesn't really make sense. So we'll just kind of look at it as like how you pronounce the letters and how they feel to me. Um, so he says like D is a, a sharp and sudden forceful explosive sound uh, cut off smartly. Now uh, then I can't tell whether this is connected with ejaculation and the idea of paternity. So he feels like the, the letter D is very paternal. And then he also, you know, go, going back to like, you know, as, as Sarah said, like there, there is sort of some geographical um sounds that like yeah okay like in that one place this is how we say dad and we say father over here but if you start to look at patterns especially with like the m letter and mom um they do appear in like multiple languages all over the world so he's saying like well the d letter you know it it, it is connected to like father gods in many different traditions you know he says that the most ancient father gods of the oldest and simplest uh, civilizations are thus named with a D, you know, in Sumar, it was Ad or Ad Ad um, And in Egypt, he says Hadith uh, and the uh, Semitic uh, Adonai, um, Adonis, De uh, Deus is the word for God in Latin. And then Valhalla, he says this is o Odin and uh, Woden. So those are kind of like his, well, it's, Obviously, D is paternal. <laughs> um, and Sarah says, looking at languages with doubles, such as L, Y, M, and R, R in Spanish, uh, could add more emphasis to this as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I, I do think like uh, there are some universal things that carry through all languages, but there are some, uh, you know, languages that are very specific to like a geographic and national orientation and you know every every land is different you know and every all the spirits of the land and all the people that live there have their own uniqueness so you will find i think variations in gods and spirits and how they manifest linguistically um we could say um you know and then he says like just try it out just just try like uh pronouncing words in english like do de dare dive doubt dog you know, try, while exploring the abyss of your mind, he says, and see whether or not uh, you do not soon associate D with a swift, hard, definite, fertile, and complete act. So he's kind of telling you, like, just play around with it, you know, just see how it, um, how it manifests, you know, and that is something uh, you, you could practice, you know, making up your own mantra if you wanted to, um, if you're sitting in meditation and sort of like, feeling like you want to vocalize something, you know, maybe try if you want to sort of manifest that energy, you know, that maybe Crowley's talking about, try, try the D's, you know. Um, and then he says N is the uh, feminine. 
he relates it to like new new eats um and noah uh john one us jonah um you know sort of these like watery starry beings the mother goddess as it appears uh considers the legends and rituals uh and noon is also um the hebrew letter noon uh means fish and relates to the water sign of scorpio which is sort of like the you know the night house of of mars um the more feminine side of mars uh it's interesting how you said you know with the exception of own which is a special case all these divine or semi-divine beings refer to the night the starry heavens the element of water the north mother goddess but on being a special case made me wonder about that and i think it mm -hmm. i think he's it's where he's talking about i mean on i think it refers to the sun but it also refers to um again this kind of gets into gematria but the yeah. the ayin ayin noon which is the hebrew letters and that value being uh 120. yeah it's really hard to separate sometimes um this from gematria and just from like looking at a word and kind of analyzing it like you know on to me it's like oh that's ain and n so that would be like the value of ain or the meaning the significance of ain which is i and then um n which is like you know scorpio and fish so it's kind of also those two letters are also the paths that lead to tefereth on the tree of life so yeah it's all kind of tied in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sarah's saying another aspect is the Spanish language, in particular accents, which we don't have in English. We have flattened, materialized, and mass produced the English language, stripping it of spirit and space, imprisoning it within, within time. We have certainly imprisoned it in business contracts. <laughs> it's, I believe English is the easiest language to uh, misrepresent or lie in. So it's, it's a very common business language. <laughs> something I've heard um, you know it is it's weird because it is the you know, sort of the the mo one of the most widely used languages um, internationally certainly um, but yeah it has lost a, a little bit of its character and flavor um, to a certain extent but you know I think regionally you'll certainly especially you know English uh, as it's spoken in the UK versus American English you'll certainly find pretty big differences in pronunciation and um, you know colloquial uh, evolution um, and then, yeah, so he, one of the things Rex and I are talking about sort of before we started was he, he mentions um, Lashtel. <laughs> um, and this is, this is really a, a pretty amazing, awesome um, essay that he references. He kind of throws um, that like a, it's like a <laughs> hand grenade right in the middle of it. <laughs> like, by the way, <laughs> um, I'm just going to share it with you guys. Uh, it's, it's the essay that's kind of attached to um, Liber V uh, or uh, Vel Regula, the, the, you know, ritual, the Book of the Prince. Um, you know, it isn't a ritual that I personally perform on a daily basis, but if you look at the essay that's attached to it, it's um, just what he's dropping there is huge, <laughs> you know. Um, it's, it's very, 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 very uh, core Thelemic ideas. And he, he kind of like um, does this sort of analysis of letters that, you know, if, if you kind of, the more you know about Thelema, the more you're like, oh shit, like, wow. <laughs> uh, you know, and he, he analyzes the word Lashtel. Um, and, you know, he talks about, uh, he references, he references it in this essay because he's like, well, you know, let's look at Shin and Tav, uh, you know, the last part of, uh, you know, in the middle part of Last Chill. And, um, you know, he just talks about how this is, uh, you know, sort of like related to the degrees of five equals six, which is the accomplishment of the great work. Um, you know, how uh, like Shin Tav is like, a resolution um, kind of between like law and all um, and these two sort of like uh, very important um, syllables <laughs> um, and actually you know I'm not going to read the whole thing you should read the essay I really highly encourage you to read the last um, analysis but uh, one of the important things I think here is if you think about the book of the law um, you know the book of the law it is Liber all is the name of the book of the law and you know, if you apply that to like this essay, things start to really uh, make sense as to why he would call it, um, you know, Lieber all. Well, essentially, I mean, it is a very dense uh, 
the one takeaway is that uh, Lashtal is another, if you break it out, the AL is, that's 31, that's the value in, in Gematria. And AL and LA both have that value since it's the same letters. And the uh, Sheen Tav also uh, is a th another way of saying 31. So those three together equal 93. So it's, um, that's just one example of how that, how that word can be, can be broken out. So it's, it's good stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's the gematria part of it, which is, you know, fun and fascinating. Um, but, <laughs> you know, Crowley isn't talking about gematria at this essay. He's talking about uh, pronunciation and the specific letters. So, but I highly encourage you, you know, if you are interested in Palima, it's a really great essay and rituals just sort of pull apart. Um, you know, uh, in your early days, even. And as you sort of like learn more about the Lima to go back to it, because it, it has like that quality of, you know, uh, the more you know, the more you get out of it. Um, you know, and then he kind of uh, gets more into an elemental tarot attribution and sort of the last half of the essay. Um, you know, he talks about the S gods. Um, you know, the S uh, is the male, the N is the female, and the D is the father, is the M is the mother. And he says, here is the idea of south or east, both quarters referring in ways very slightly detergent to the element of fire, the sun, the father god, in his aspect as the Holy Ghost, and the ancient tradition that appears in the Gospels, the lesser mysteries of John, beheaded by the sword and consumed by the disc. You know, so those are like the, the lesser mysteries. And then the greater mysteries of Jesus, pierced with a wand and consumed in a cup, all the same tarot. So there he's kind of alluding to like some of the, the greater and lesser mysteries and their elemental attributions. Um, you know, and then he kind of closes out. He's like, hey, this is might be useful to you if you're practicing magic, <laughs> you know? Um, I feel that I should have rendered you quite a bit of service by calling your attention to the uh, existence of the subject uh, by stimulating you to research, by suggesting a certain potential lines along which to attack the same, and perhaps even by giving you a few tips which you may find useful and practical in magic. So I think that's, he's kind of planting some seeds as to maybe some of the logic um, that he uses to look at language that you can also like utilize and sort of run with and or in your own world. Uh, Rex, did you have anything to add to that? Um, just, just the observation that, you know, again, he's, he's relying on, <clears throat> I think he picked these letters for a reason. I think it's because he, uh, he sees everything, probably sees everything in like male, female and um, father, mother, at least in kind of a large symbol set. And so I think these, these are letters that uh, he associates with, with those ideas. And so that's, that's if, if we need to understand what, why he's talking about these particular words, I think that's just what it comes down to. Yeah, Sarah's asking if he associates John with the lesser, which is odd. Why does he associate, who does he associate with the, the greater? Yeah, um, you know, I think uh, you can look at the greater and lesser mysteries, uh, you know, cabalistically, the, the lesser mysteries are kind of further down on the, on the tree of life. They're kind of more dealing with like that sort of triad of personality that you find like in, you know, you sewed uh, Hode and Netzlock and then kind of the greater mysteries are sort of like above and, you know, and Tiferet and Hesed and uh, Yabura. Um, so, you know, I think elementally he's like tying them to those and he even ties them to the tarot and the tarot suits. So um, I'm just curious, he, he associates any of the evangelists or any major figures um, with the greater mysteries as he does with John's The Lesser. Well, it says in the essay, the greater mysteries um, are associated with Jesus. Uh, he oh, says, sorry, pierced, pierced with a wand and consumed in a cup. So, and, you know, uh, Jesus can uh, also be um, Kabbalistically, it's sort of like associated with Tifereth, um, which is sort of the beginning of like the, the greater mysteries. Uh, once you get sort of above the triad of personality, the, the greater mysteries are kind of more found in, you know, the, the ethical triangle, as uh, it's called. And then beyond that is sort of the the supernals, which is even more transpersonal. Um, so that's what I would assume he, the Jesus is kind of a, a Tiferet thing and maybe John is sort of the, a Yusso thing. Um, although I'm not incredibly familiar with his sort of Christian <laughs> interpretations of the tree of life. Rex, do you have any? Not, not really. Yeah. I, think, I think that's about all we can say right here. 
Yeah. I mean, I would think that John is Doth, or as um, I forget the name of the um, your fellow brother that did the talk on equilibrium was was putting Bina in that place as well. Um, but the whole decapitation is, you know, it, it is a journey into the underworlds and into the unconscious and, and a crossing of the abyss. Is, that's what John represents. So I would put him there. Um, but yeah, I was just curious. I have a very personal relationship with John. So I didn't know if there were any other figures that popped up. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it depends, you know, are you talking about John the Baptist or are you talking about a different John? Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, specifically here. Um, I would say the unconscious can also be uh, represented by Yisod, you know, you, like the unconscious is also uh, sort of a, there's like sort of the subconscious, which is in the lower part of the personality. And then there's like the, the higher conscious, you know, which is above the abyss. So there are sort of different uh, states of unconscious. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. David Lake is saying he's also slain at the behest of the Babylon style queen, which is interesting. So yeah. Yeah, John the Baptist is a pretty fascinating figure. John St. John. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I don't know. I'm sure you could do like a, a search of Crowley's work for all of his references to John and see if he has more to say about it. But unfortunately, I don't have any more to say about it. And it's, it's possible he might even not really even be mentioning John the Baptist. He could be speaking of another John. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of a little bit of like what Crowley's talking about when he gets crazy about letters and <laughs> goes on and on about them. Um, you know, it's sort of uh, really breaking down words and in analyzing them. And, you know, a lot of that is really associated to like uh, the power of Thoth and Mercury and um, magic. And magic is attributed to uh, the Sephiroth of Hode. Um, you know, there's kind of like, a magical the, one of the, the spheres of magic specifically um so just keep that in mind when you're sort of studying language and uh analyzing things you know using the power of mercury and the hermit <laughs> so uh and then he just you know he closes it out um really well you know he tells us uh you know i have noticed um for instance, many of the chapters in the Quran have the letter L for a let motif. Uh, you know, Islam attaches immense importance to this liquid L as it appears in Allah compared to the Hebrew L gods, Al, Aloha, Elohim, uh, Alion, etc. And look up the L idea in your book of Thoth and in Magic, page 331, and other particularly sacred names and words. So giving you a little, a little food for thought if you want to pursue that. Um, get out your Get out your big blue brick. <laughs> Look stuff up. Instead of trying to read it straight through, as some of us try and fail. <laughs> That's not really a cover to cover read. It, it can be, but it can, you know, you can also lose momentum trying to slog through the whole thing. So any, anyone else want to add anything to reading the God letters? I hope we've covered enough. There one single chapter tonight. I like the discussion, uh, just the general theme that you know language is magic because I think that is a big point here. Um, the way we express ourselves, the way the way we pronounce words, the way we uh, um, do that activity as part of a ritual or just in our day to day lives, it it can be very magical. Yeah, and there's a lot of other sort of you know avant garde thinkers. It's, is it William Burroughs who said that language is a virus from outer space? You know, <laughs> I believe that was, I'm going to attribute to William Burroughs. And then, you know, uh, if you ever listen to Terence McKenna's wonderful lectures, you know, he talks a lot about like the, his, his theories on, you know, people doing mushrooms and, you know, acquiring language uh, <laughs> via the mushroom people in, in our evolution. So, um, you know, it is it is something that like, uh, you know, we find a lot of other species just don't have like the, the complex um, language skills that humans have developed. So it's sort of a fascinating thing, you know, according to man. Um, yeah, Libra 5, uh, Diane, is where you would find uh, that essay. It is in, I believe it's in, it's in, book four, so it's in magic, but then if you just want to look on hermetic.com, um, here is the link for it. Uh, it's a ritual at first, and then kind of the last half of it is sort of like this um, amazing 
analysis of letters. Um, the he, page numbers listed there are not the right ones. So. Yeah, yeah, this was before this 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 was published God in the seventies, I believe, um, and then you know obviously like re-upped uh, several pre-printed several times, so you can't. Uh, yeah, yeah, you um, can't, can't page, really. Page five seventy six in my in my copy for for reference. Yeah, I believe uh, magic. Um, what I did to find a, a few of his quotes was, you know, it is um, sectioned out in hermetic.com um, magic book four. And so I just went through every section and just kind of controlled F and typed in the word, a unique word I was looking for and kind of found it that way. But um, just just go to the last chill uh, ritual. And <laughs> it's much easier than digging through book four to find. Um, so yeah, next week, like I said, it'll be our last class. Uh, so it's February 10th, um, 6.30 p.m. Uh, and ooh, something exciting is happening. <laughs> Baseball. Um, <laughs> uh, so we'll be going over um, chapter 75, uh, the AA and the planet, and chapter uh, 81, um, methods of training. So kind of closing it out with a little bit of like, you know, how do you get more training? Should I join the AA? That's sort of, uh, I thought it would be appropriate to kind of close uh, with that. And then um, stick around after we have that half an hour, 40 minute discussion, we'll have a special sort of half an hour, 40 minute presentation from Heather Schubert. And she'll be talking just a little bit about the history of Magic Without Tears from like the, the letter writer perspective uh, that wasn't Crowley, the uh, person who asked questions. And she'll have some visuals and it'll be rad. Heather's great. So really excited to have. Uh, yeah, she's done a lot of research on the, 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 the woman who was one of the main contributors to the letters for the for this book. So should be good. Yeah. So invite your friends. Have dress up. <laughs> Fancy dress only. Um, cool. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and uh, have a great week. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, yeah, fan. Great to see everyone. And uh, love is the law. Love under will.